Hey everybody, so I am Carrie the Mortician and I do weekly live chats. We talk about all sorts of different things. I try and shine good light on the funeral business. However, sometimes we have to talk about the naughty things that's naughty that funeral directors do. So today I'm going to be sharing six times that I have been thoroughly embarrassed by a funeral scandal. So the first, in September of 2017, police arrested 27-year-old Angel Stewart. And she was a funeral director at Lanterman and Allen Funeral Home in Pennsylvania. She pled guilty to abusing 16 deceased. And this is where I get angry because for what she did, um, she took photos of the deceased when they were in her care and she shared them with people. Took them in all sorts of different varying stages of preparation and coming in after autopsies. And she took them and shared them for humor and for entertainment value. That really pisses me off because people cannot defend themselves when they are dead. They are completely at our mercy and it's super vulnerable and we are supposed to be protecting their integrity. So one of the worst things I think you can do is anything to embarrass that person in that stage. And this has become a big issue with social media lately too. We're seeing some TikTokers that have lawsuits because they're embalming when there's deceased in the room, sharing photos, all sorts of social media stuff that's happening because people are going too far. So in this situation, um, they terminated her license. They did, uh, they lessened the abuse of a corpse charge to misdemeanor tampering with evidence, which I'm sorry, but throw the book at them. If they mess with people that are deceased, they shouldn't get lesser charges. Uh, her sentence included hours of community service and probation. A little light, I think, on that. But former funeral director, Angel Stewart, that's naughty. Now, number two, Pocatella, Idaho. And a lot of you have sent this one to me because this just recently happened. A uh, recent naughty funeral home story in the news surfaced in September of this year, 2021. Idaho State University had made a complaint because they had been not been receiving donated cadavers. So they kind of got alerted that something was up um, through connections with families. They found there were other families who believed they had donated their loved ones and that the school never received them. So where are these people? The Idaho State Journal reports police found several dead bodies and fetuses in a search of Downard Funeral Home. U.S. News reported police say the remains of roughly 50 fetuses were found at the funeral home that were part of a biological collection that the university had given to them to cremate back in 2017 and they never cremated. They just stored all of these fetuses that were supposed to have been cremated. The fetuses and at least 12 other decomposing bodies were discovered at the funeral home after a health inspector alerted police. Investigators have been working to identify the remains. This is a really recent, really new story. So we don't know what charges are gonna be pressed. We don't know what the outcome or verdict is going to be because they're still trying to figure out what the heck is really happening there. However, owner Lance Peck, that's naughty. Don't do that. Now, number three, we're going over to the Sunset Mesa funeral home case. So Megan Hess and her mother, Shirley Cock, under the nonprofit Sunset Mesa Funeral Foundation, and we're doing businesses as donor services. So they harvested, sold, and sold human remains, including heads, torsos, arms, legs, or entire bodies 
to customers who use the remains for scientific, medical, or educational purposes. Now, they incentivized with the offer of free or reduced cremation costs to people so that they would get more business and more traffic through the funeral home. Some families consented when their individual loved ones went for cremation for the sale of specific organs or tumors to be donated to be studied. However, according to the indictment, few families consented or knew the extent to which Hess and Cock Coke, cock, not sure how you pronounce that, were selling and profiting off of these bodies. Courthouse news reports between 2010 and 2018, when the state shut down the funeral home, the funeral home reaped hundreds of thousands of dollars still. They each face 18 counts of fraud and swindles, as well as six counts of mail fraud because some of the deceased that they were shipping through the mail were HIV positive remains. So that was the biggest, and that was the first way that they were able to kind of shut them down and press charges was this mail fraud. Each kind of mail fraud carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in federal prison. That's crazy. That's, that's good though. Um, over 60 plaintiffs filed in this case which means 60 deceased at least were mishandled. People received back cremated remains that were not theirs or no cremated remains at all. So Megan Hess and your mama, Shirley, that's naughty. All right, number four. In June of 1988, state inspectors found several decomposing bodies outside of the Howell Morning Glory Chapel Funeral Home in Jacksonville, Florida. How many of you remember this? I mean, this is back a ways, so some of our younger viewers probably don't remember, but if you're in Florida back in the 80s, this was a huge story. The deceased were stacked like cordwood, as they said, inside a closed funeral home. Dug up the yard outside during the search, and they found more bodies out in the yard, some of which were stacked up and piled inside of a hearse. So they were just packed in wherever they could get the most bodies packed in, which is horrible. One, disgusting. Two, how unbelievably disrespectful. Further investigation led authorities to discover over 35 unembalmed bodies and body parts located inside the building in the funeral home. And an exhumation of three nearby caskets revealed up to eight bodies contained inside one casket alone. So the courts convicted uh, the funeral home owner of felony theft for accepting money for funerals that were not performed and sentenced him to one year in prison, but he only served three months. Owner Lewis Howell had stacked the majority of the deceased on top of one another in a closet. How big is this closet is what I'm thinking. This has to be not your average closet. Examiners determined the owner had stored some bodies for as long as 10 years. He said it all began when he had indigent bodies and no funds from the state to allow him to care for them. Kind of a snowball effect, which can happen, especially with mishandling of money with funeral homes. I think sometimes, you know, you like, as soon as you feel like you can take $5 and nobody will notice right away, then you take 10 and then at 20 and it kind of snowballs. And it sounds like this is a snowball situation. We started, nobody found out and it just kept going, going, going. But the stench that had to have been in that funeral home, unbelievable. So I don't know how that got past anybody that ever stepped inside that building. But Lewis J. Howell, that's naughty. Now, number five. In July 2017, authorities shut down Swanson Funeral Home in Flint, Michigan. So coming into my territory here in Michigan, this was a big story here. 
State inspectors discovered deceased in an unair conditioned garage, just rotting. There were maggots on the floor of the facility's garage and the garage door. There were unrefrigerated human remains stored for more than 90 days and up to five months they had been there. The building stunk like decomposing bodies. Unsanitary preparation room without equipment or supplies necessary for embalming even. Blood and fluid stained pillows were also laying in the hallway. Like if you're gonna be dirty and nasty, why be super sloppy about it? Why not try and hide it even just a little bit? And in the business lost operating licenses and the court fined uh, him over $34,000. He was also fined when he was found operating and selling pre-funded funerals with no license. Michigan has been pretty naughty in the last few years, so inspections had increased as of late. And the Metro Times reported in the past year and a half, state officials investigating several funeral homes where hundreds of cremated remains, including fetuses, were left behind. So when a funeral home closes, Nobody goes in to make sure everything's been taken out. So sometimes you're going to get things left like unclaimed cremated remains. Why there's fetuses or if they meant cremated remains that were fetuses maybe is what they, they phrased there, which I say all the time, there's always unclaimed cremated remains at funeral homes. Every funeral home has to have that shelf somewhere, I swear, because people don't pick up their loved ones. So in this situation, it looks like when they close doors at some places, they just left those. In February 2019, detectives found at least seven sets of cremated remains in the basement of the former Howell Funeral Home in Detroit, which had been closed for years. And in October of 2018, 63 fetuses were found inside Perry Funeral Home on Detroit's west side. Uh, a few weeks earlier, they had made the same discovery at Cantrell Funeral Home on the east side where 11 fetal remains were found. So soon after that, inspectors found more than 300 fetuses, as I was saying, at Cantrell Funeral Home and had cited for unsanitary conditions. Yeah, if you're finding remains that are not in the time frame of death, bring into the funeral home, burial or cremate, it's going to get very unsanitary. So Michigan has kind of ramped up their naughty. Michigan, you're naughty. Um, but in this case, the main one, Swanson Funeral Home, O'Neill Swanson II. That's naughty. All right now we've got number six: the grisly discoveries on January twentieth, nineteen eighty-seven, was one of the most bizarre scandals in California funeral history. We've done Michigan, now we're going out to California. So back in the 80s, a uh, respected industry family, the Lamb family, got all tangled up in this insane crime. Um, still unfolding with organ thefts up to possibly homicide happening. So that also prompted a new state law making it easier to police crematories and um, watching over lawsuits against other mortuaries that sent bodies to the Lamb Funeral Home in Pasadena because they had this bargain basement price, they were bringing in extra bodies and they were bringing in work from all over the place to get more bodies coming through, which meant more naughtiness. So the gentleman running it, David Sconce, uh, would attract business from other funeral homes with this half price cremation. And he would make up for the low cost by doing such a high volume. His business plan caught on and business boomed. The crematorium offered two retorts and he would stuff five, six, or however many bodies in it he could. At one point, he tried to stuff 18, physically don't even know how that's possible, 18 bodies at one time. They expanded in 1986, 
to the creation of Coastal International Eye and Tissue Bank. Oh, doesn't it sound very upstanding and a great place for you to want to donate your organs and tissue to help others, right? So the sole purpose of the company was to facilitate David's side gig trafficking organs he'd removed from soon to be cremated deceased. If consent for the removal was not done, don't worry, David's mom jumped on in there and she signed the authorizations just to have something on paper. Harvested eyes, hearts, brains were sold on the market for up to $95 a piece. On November 23, 1986, the super old, the century old facility, 100 year old facility burned to the ground after they had shoved. And I, I can only imagine using the word shove because that's the only way you're getting upwards of 18 or 19 bodies into one retort at a time, shoving. So it burned to the ground because of this, but don't worry, David kept going. He shifted operations to another facility. It was a metal warehouse operating under a license for a ceramic factory. He started cremating bodies in the huge brick kilns until they figured out what was going on. And the fire chief discovered in January of 1987, the gruesome, disgusting, naughty, naughty thing that he had been doing. There was even talk that he had murdered a rival crematory operator, but no charges were ever proven. So David Scott's former funeral director who drove around in your car that had a license plate that read, I burn for you. Say it with me, guys. That's naughty. Super naughty. Bad. Now, had to add a bonus number seven to this lineup because this is one that had begun at the beginning of my career as a licensed funeral director. And it really has impacted the industry since. When you think of scandal and when you think of super naughty people in the funeral business, what pops in your mind? So our bonus number seven is the tri-state crematory scandal in Georgia. So this changed how families trusted funeral homes and crematories forever, I believe, because I think we still are seeing families questioning, how do I know if I'm getting back my loved one? Because of what a high profile story this was. And I think some of the ones back in the 80s weren't quite as high profile because we didn't have social media. We didn't have that instant news reporting that we did up in 2002 when this happened in February 15th of 2002, police were called to the Tri-State Crematory in Noble, Georgia. They had been called there over the years, but people, there's all sorts of stories like they were paid off or they were told to kind of turn a blind eye or they just didn't want to investigate it deep enough. Whatever that is, let's look at the naughty person and not the police or anybody else or what was the here, he said, she said thing there. But the EPA was called in 2002, and they took this very seriously. Um, story says that someone was out walking their dog, found a body in the woods because this was on a large property um, on 18 acres. And so they called the EPA. So they went to inspect reports of the deceased on the property. Long investigation short, they found 339 bodies. 339, not like five, not 20, 339 on the 18 acres. That's a lot. The families had been sent cement or wood shavings or a combination of that all together when they received back their loved ones cremated remains. So they had been not operating, not caring for these people and just disposing of the bodies returning garbage to the family, essentially, that they were holding on to, having services for burying 
and believing was their loved ones. There was one report that someone had gone through the cremated remains and had found like a zipper and a button, things that their loved one did not have on them at the time of the cremation. That was a huge red flag to them as well. And they started questioning. So over time, things just kept getting red flagged, but nothing was really being done until this in 2002. After investigations, nearly 100 of the remains were still unidentified. I don't know how that happens, but 100 unidentified that have since been cared for and had a disposition, but they were still unknown who they were. Ray Marsh, that is extremely naughty, 339, that's crazy. So over time, we have had a lot of examples of super naughty funeral directors. So I know I try and dispel some of the bad press that is out there on funeral directors that may, may be um, not quite as honest as others, but these are truly cases of people being super, super naughty within the funeral business. So to all of you again, that's naughty. Thank you guys. Share stories from where you live, what you've heard, naughty stories of funeral directors. You guys like to share them. <laughs> you guys like to tell me that I'm one of the many of bad funeral directors or whatever. Not all of you, but some of you do. So share your stories below in comments. Thank you so much for joining me. I love this idea for a video. Some of you have asked about That's Naughty shirts, um, koozies, things like that. So check out the description of the video for links to the That's Naughty merchandise. Thank you guys, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.